Hey, good morning, risers. How you guys doing? What's up? I am so glad that some of you thought that video was funny because I just didn't know how it was going to go. Like, I'm like, this is super cheesy, but I'm glad you laughed. So, hey, welcome. If you're new to our church, my name is Brent, and I'm so glad you're here. I get the privilege of being your lead pastor, and we're going to continue to experience God today. Hey, we want to celebrate as we get started. That's our normal custom. And I just think it's so cool that a friend of mine who pastors a smaller church, uh, his wife had a baby. I don't even know how you say that. Did he have a baby? Like, how do you word that right? But his wife had a baby. And, um, and so... Uh, uh, just a couple days ago. And so he reached out and said, hey, do you have somebody who can preach for me this weekend? And I said, absolutely. So Pastor Mike is over preaching for a church over in Tampa today. Yeah. And isn't that cool? Isn't that the way the body of Christ should function? Um, just, you know, he's a friend and we can, we can assist him in that time of need and, and make sure that his focus can stay where it needs to be right there. I know a lot of pastors who would still be preaching today uh, because it's in their heart and I appreciate that. But family should always be first. Amen. Amen. So I just think that's, that's really cool. Uh, also, and I forgot to bring stuff out, is uh, Ernie and Mimi, thank you, Ken. Is Ernie and Mimi in here? Are they outside? All right, now you guys got to come up, because last week we tried to announce you guys as a volunteer spotlight. And the one Sunday a year, y'all got to run up here. The one Sunday a year that you guys aren't here, we... Um, announced you guys last week. So anyway, so now you're here this week and we just want to honor you guys because we have amazing volunteers around this church and, uh, and two of them are right here in front of you. They are everywhere all the time. Uh, every time there's a gap somewhere to fill, they jump inside of those gaps. They are here cleaning. Uh, it's like almost every day I feel like they're here and they never miss a service except the one time <laughs> that we have the volunteer spotlight. But it was your birthday so we, we give you guys that. So we are giving you guys Goldfish Epic Crunch because you guys are epic. Come on. If you're going to laugh at the Godfather. So, anyway. Thank you. God bless you. We love you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So, that was really awkward last week. I announced them in first service and I'm like, and they're not here. They're always here. Like, they're never not here. The one Sunday a year. Anyway. Hey, a couple weeks ago, we talked about The Count of Monte Cristo being a great literary work uh, and, uh, you know, the movie and such. You know, another one is the curiously cr strange case or the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Anybody ever heard of that? Yeah, you've all heard of that, right? Uh, in fact, it's really kind of become a key part of pop culture in general. We actually use the phrase Jekyll and Hyde just to refer to split personality and when somebody does two things that are just weird and, and they're this way and then they're suddenly this way and, and we actually refer to that, but... um. Uh, a guy by the name of, uh, uh, a Scottish author by the name of Robert Louis Stevenson actually wrote the book in 1886. And since that time, it has just exploded onto the scene um, and, and has been in over 120 different screenplays or actually uh, screen time on, the, on movies and TV shows and things like that. It is all over the place. And, uh, and it's really hard to miss. And I think one of the reasons why we as a humans love the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is because we find ourselves in it, Right. In fact, um, they asked uh, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson one time, they asked him, where did you get the idea behind Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? Where did that idea come from? And he actually replied back, because he was a Christian, he said, I find it in my own nature. Anybody can agree with that? Yeah. Like, like one second you can be this, and one second you can, you can be that. In fact, I, I almost called this message split personality. Because as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus who's trying to do right, do you ever feel like you have a split personality? Like you come in this morning and you worship Jesus out of your mouth and then tomorrow morning you cuss your boss out under your breath out of that same mouth. With James said should never happen. Blessings and curses shouldn't come out of the same mouth. But yet it comes out of the same mouth. You ever feel like you have a split personality? You want so desperately to encourage people and love people but sometimes you discourage people. You want so desperately to do one thing but you find yourself doing the other and even in this place, you can, you can be singing as you drive home this afternoon. I love you, Lord. You're so amazing. And somebody can cut you off and something else can come out of your mouth that's not so uplifting right after that. And you can feel like you have a split personality. And so, you know, the author of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde said he found this in his own nature. That's where it comes from. In fact, I love this. He said, this is his words. He said, I always struggled to live with the beast that lies within me. Can anybody relate to that? I always struggle to live with the beast that lies within, lives within me. You know, the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Dr. Jekyll is kind and courteous and sweet and gentle and loving. and Everybody loves Dr. Jekyll. Mr. Hyde, 
is a murderous savage. Anybody ever relate to that? Split personality. I love you, Lord, and I hate this person, which gospel writers are very clear. You can't love God while you hate your brother. It's a split personality. It's a, it's a weird, weird thing. Um, some of you have that happen every day, if you're honest, because it's just what you call before and after coffee. <laughs> you get up in the morning. I hate you. Don't talk to me. I Get away from me. You drink like, you know, half a cup of coffee. You're like, I love you all. You're so great. Dr. and Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, happens every morning. Um, anyway, as we lead into this, normally we read a passage together. You're welcome to follow along, especially if you have your phone and you're following along that way. Normally we read a passage together. We're going to come back and look at the passage a bunch, but just to break it up a little bit, uh, we're going to um, follow along as it's dramatized read for us on the screens in just a second. It's Romans chapter 7, verse 14 through 25 there. Then we're going to go into chapter 8 a little bit towards the end of the message. I will come back and read through a bunch of things you're going to hear here. But just to break it up a little bit, instead of just doing it the traditional way, let's listen to it. Romans chapter 7, verse 14 through 25. Go ahead. So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself. For I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I, I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all of my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. So I've got issues. And welcome to the last of this three-part message entitled, I've Got Issues. It's not only three because I only have three issues, it's three because we only had three weeks to talk about my issues. <laughs> we could probably spend the next year talking about my issues, but it's only three weeks for that reason. I've noticed there's a disparity between who I want to be and who I am. I've noticed that in my own life, I desperately want to live this high calling of God, but I oftentimes fall way short of it. There's a gap between who I want to be and who I am. I want desperately to have the fruit of the Spirit come out of my life and to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit to the world, but oftentimes I demonstrate the fruit of the flesh instead. I want to respond in love, but sometimes I respond in anger. I want to be an amazing father, but sometimes I fall so short of that. I want to be an amazing husband, but sometimes I fall so short of that. I want my life to be an encouragement to others, but sometimes I find myself discouraging others in the moment. I want my life to be 
so much greater than just what it can be inside of itself, but oftentimes I don't lean on the voice of the Holy Spirit to guide me. I'd rather guide myself in the moment, and then I pay the consequences later. As we've said this whole series, this is one especially that there's room on the couch for you as well. Because there's something inside of me that desperately wants to be like my father. And I don't mean my earthly father necessarily. I don't mean uh, the man who raised you that it might be for you. But, but, but I want to be like my heavenly father. There's something inside of us as believers that I, I desperately want to be like my dad. If he did this, I can do it. And I want to be all that he wants me to be. But I find that I fall so, so short of that. There are some people that can pray for hours at a time. My wife is one of those people... I try to set aside prayer time and then I miss it or I can't pray long enough or my mind gets distracted and I fall so far below that standard I want to live at. I want to make sure I read the Bible and study the Bible all the time, but, but sometimes I miss days and I miss other times. And, and don't judge me right now because some of you are going to be like, well, that's, you're, you're the pastor. You missed a week or a month or two months or it's been two years since you actually opened the Bible when you weren't in church. Just put this in your world. I want to fast because I want to be closer to God. I even put it in my calendar about a year ago or so. I put the first three days of every month to be fast days, every month, no matter what. That way I can make sure I fast about a tithe back to God. And I can fast the first three days. And I find that about once every three months do I actually fulfill that vow of fasting. Again, some of you will look at me and be like, well, I haven't fasted in 10 years. It's not about you. This is my couch right now. (laughs) Your struggle is going to be different than mine. My point is I have this high expectation of myself and what I can be and what I can do and and I really want to be closer to Jesus but then I fall so short of that sometimes. And when you fall short of that you end up feeling demoralized and frustrated not with anybody else but with yourself. I know I could live to this standard but I just don't. I want to memorize Bible verses and some people just make me sick because they just memorize verses like it's crazy. I struggle to memorize Bible verses and I try to plan it in my calendar and I got systems for that. And then I talked to Dr. Brown and Dr. Brown said he memorized something like 120 verses in the first month he was saved. And I'm like, I hate you. (laughs) I've been saved 20 some odd years and I don't know if I've memorized 120 verses altogether. I'm trying though. But it's frustrating because I can memorize a song that I haven't heard in 30 years. I can memorize what numbers go with the players on the field. I can memorize the TV channels. Come on. But sometimes I struggle to memorize the word of God and it's frustrating. It's irritating inside of myself. In fact, sometimes I start condemning myself. Can I just be real honest with you? Even a moment ago, I'm looking over and I said, I forgot to mention that next week I'm supposed to tell you to bring a friend. That was the whole purpose of the video, and I missed it. (laughs) Pastor Josh was on the front row going, Pastor Britt forgot to tell people. And so I condemn myself because I'm supposed to remind you after service, get a door hanger, take it with you and a yard sign and all that. So I beat myself up over it. See, I want to be more. And if I'm honest, though, there's a little bit of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in me. If we're real, there's a little bit of a sinner and a saint within me. And there's a struggle that's real. In fact, of all the things that we've talked about these last three weeks, this is probably the one that all of us can relate to, at least in one regard or the other. Because the struggle is real for every one of us. The struggle is... And and, and if, and if... If you're not careful, it leads, you know, last week we talked about depression and the week before we talked about the imposter syndrome. And if we're not careful, all of these are connected because when you feel like you don't live up to the standard that you create for yourself, you feel like an imposter and you can get depressed because you get condemned within your own mind, self-condemnation because you're not living up to the standard because you believe in yourself and you believe that you can do what God's called you to do and you want so much more. And if you're like that, you're in good company because the Apostle Paul, the man who wrote most of the New Testament and next to Jesus Christ himself, was the most influential person in the history of Christianity. The Apostle Paul said in verse 18 and 19, he said, I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Anybody relate to that? 
I want to do right. I want to do good. I want to be better. I want to be everything God's called me to be. But I find myself living so far beyond, below that standard. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Can you hear the tension and the frustration and the self-condemnation within his own voice? Written thousands of years ago as he's fighting through this struggle that so many of us fight if you just put yourself on your own confessional couch and be honest with yourself. The struggle is real. See, some people think this is Paul pre-conversion. Like there's some theologians that they get like really into themselves. This is my opinion, but they get into themselves and they, they, they come up with these different ideas and they're like, this, this can't be the Christian life now. This has to be Paul talking about pre-conversion. The problem with that is it says I throughout the passage, like present tense now, me. The other part of that that's the problem is that all of us live through this. <laughs> the struggle's real. The struggle's real. Paul struggled. The struggle's real. Have you ever had those moments where you thought, what's wrong with me? Okay, come on, because I know you can't say amen right now, but <laughs> what's wrong with me? I, I want to be all this, but I find I'm so far below that standard. And this is Paul's moment where he's just being open and honest and bearing his soul. This is Paul's couch confessional in Romans chapter 7. And he's saying, I want to do good, but I struggle. I want to be all God's called me to be, but I struggle. I don't want to do this. And sometimes I find myself doing that thing I don't want to do. And it's Paul's confessional. You see, in this story, Paul is actually comparing and contrasting the law versus grace. See, in Paul's world, different than our world, they grew up memorizing the Old Testament Torah and that had been their Bible their entire life and, and it all revolved around these laws that they had to keep. But Paul's comparing and contrasting to teach that the law and grace are two different things and, and really this whole picture is a story. If, if, you, if we see the whole thing in a few minutes, we'll see more of it together. But the whole thing is a story of a man who's trying to be good by the law standards and, and he just can't do it. And so he's comparing this Old Testament idea with this New Testament idea of grace, this old covenant and new covenant, and he's comparing and contrasting them. In fact, if you were to go back a few verses to Romans chapter 7, verse 7, he's talking about the law, and he says, I would not have known, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. And he makes this point that kind of leads into, and it comes a foundation to where we landed at in Romans 7. He's saying the law gives us knowledge of sin. In fact, repeatedly in Romans 7, he says, the law is good. The law is good. The law is good. The law gives us knowledge of sin. It reveals the standards of God. The law says, this is God's standard. The law says, this is the rules and you'd better keep them. But it gives you no empowerment to actually keep them. Which, therein lies the problem. Dion, do me a favor and run up here with me again. Since you're in this service again. Um, the law sets a standard, and it's a, it's a very high standard. Trying to keep the law, this, 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 this high standard of perfection, is impossible. So, Dion, so, so in order to, to keep the law, this is what I need you to do. I need you to jump and touch the ceiling for me. <laughs> Listen, I know I can't do it because I'm a white guy, but come on. <laughs> white men can't jump. I know it. They made a movie about it. make the excuse okay <laughs> you, you can't do it the law sets this standard that you cannot reach why because it's perfection and so what happens is trying to keep the law apart from Christ leads into religion now I know there's guests in this room and you're like but this is a religious place what's wrong with religion religion is a negative thing in general because it revolves around all these rules and ideas and 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 you know Christianity was never meant to be a religion it was a relationship with Jesus it wasn't meant to, it, it kind of turns into different things. And some of you grew up in these atmospheres of religion. That's not, that's not what Jesus was doing. So, so religion creates all these ideas of what's right and wrong. And, 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 and if you're going to reach this standard, because uh, religion is just man's attempt to get to God. That's what every religion is. It's their attempt to get to God. In all religions, people end up frustrated and irritated because it doesn't work. By its nature, the spirit of religion says if you do all these things to keep all this order of perfection, which are always impossible to keep perfectly, then you can get to God. 
You can't do it. And this is why if you ever travel the world and you see people in religious uh, institutions, Christianity included, but all of them, Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, Islam, all of them, people are frustrated. They're bound up. In fact, the, the uh, word for religion literally comes from a root word that means to bind up. That's what it means, to bind up. <laughs> so, to, give me your hands, please. So, um, thank you, Dion. I love you, man. You know you're my brother from another mother. <laughs> and we got the same haircut, so. <laughs> so, so religion ends up binding you up because, because you try to keep all these rules, but they are impossible to keep. Right, like some of us grew up in that atmosphere in the church world where you're trying to keep rules because you were taught, like if you go to the movie theater, that's a sin. Growing up, like if we had what's called mixed bathing, and, I, and I, it's still a weird word to say now this, but like if you went to the beach or anything, the girls had to go first, then the guys and vice versa. If you go to a pool, guys and girls couldn't both go in the, the pool, which probably isn't a bad idea sometimes, just to be honest with you, when you're working with teenagers especially. But, but that was a sin. We couldn't go to a restaurant that had a bar in it, so like a Beef O'Brady's or something like that, because they serve alcohol and it's got a bar in it. You can't go there because that's sin. And so, so, so you end up walking your whole life trying to make sure don't sin. Got to make sure. Woo! God forbid Jesus come back while you're in that movie theater. Woo! Man. Some of y'all don't even know what we're talking about. Just be thankful. If you didn't grow up in church, you just, just be thankful. So, so we're trying to keep the law, but it leaves us frustrated because the law reveals a standard that is impossible to live up to. Because every time you turn around, you're sinning on something else again. And, and you just can't be perfect because you were never meant to. And in revealing God's standard, it oftentimes shows us how imperfect our standard is. God has a perfect standard. Ours is imperfect. And our attempts to be perfect are always imperfect. And so we end up condemned and demoralized and frustrated and irritated at ourselves because I want to be this. Always this. I have such high expectations because I know who Jesus is and I want to be everything he's calling me to be, but I struggle so greatly. You know, what we did in the church world where I was growing up and in the religious organization of the church sometimes is we made all the sins about the sins of commission, not the sins of omission. Sins of commission are the things you shouldn't do. Don't do this, don't do this. Don't drink, smoke, or chew, or run with girls who do, right? That was the thing. Don't do that, Right? Sins of omission are far more powerful. And they're far more Christian, by the way. Sins of omission is all about what you should be doing that you're not doing. You know, when Jesus summarized the whole law, when he gave us a New Testament law to replace the Old Testament, you know what he said? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Anything in there about what not to do? Well, there's some things you're not going to do as you're doing what you're supposed to do. You see... Focusing on what we shouldn't do always leads to religion. Focusing on what we should do leads to Christ. Jesus said, follow me. What should I do? I follow Christ. Now here's the thing. As you follow Christ, there's things you're not going to do. And and this is where it gets really complicated for for most of us because we want everything standardized inside the law. We want everything to be this. But but the new law and the new covenant wasn't that way at all. So we want everything to be the same for everybody and be unilateral standard. So don't go to movies or do go to movies, but choose and be that. But here's the problem with that. When the law is written on your heart, like the law of grace that Paul's beginning to talk about and going to lead us into, as it's written on your heart, that means that you could actually have one person who feels strongly because the Holy Spirit in them knows that they can't handle the movie theater and another person who goes to the movie theater six days a week. And then you got Pastor Tina where God always speaks to her during the movie in the movie theater. <laughs> Are you with me? So, so, so. So, so the standard could actually be a little different from person to person because the standard's written on your heart. It's not written on tone, stone tablets any longer. And so, so we get bound up. And, 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 and Christianity is not about what you're not doing. Some of you grew up in that. Christianity is about what you are doing. And when you are focused on the right way, you will stop doing the things you shouldn't be doing. But if, say it this way, whatever you focus on, you will go towards in some regards, you're, you're like a horse, right? You put a bridle on a horse. You put a bit in its mouth. If you turn the horse's head to the right, I know you bunch of city people never rode a horse in your life, but just trust me. If you turn the horse to the head to the right, the horse is going to go to the right. 
Turn it to the left, it's going to go to the left. Because horses will always go to what they can see. So if you, wherever you want it to go, just point its head in that direction. You're the same way. Even, even you, you ever try to look to the right or left and walk straight? You always end up crooked. <laughs> Why? Because you're the same way. If you focus on everything you shouldn't do, you're going to do it. But if you focus on everything you should do, you are going to do it, and you will not do the things you shouldn't do. I don't, I don't not cheat on my wife because it's a sin to cheat on my wife. That's a really low standard. I don't cheat on my wife because I love my wife and I want to honor my wife. And as I'm loving and honoring my wife, I don't cheat on my wife. You with me? But if I sit around all day long and think, I'm not going to cheat on Ada today. I'm not going to cheat on Ada today. I'm not you do that long enough, you're going to cheat on your wife. My goodness. What a horrible standard. But isn't that the way religion gets? It binds you up with all these rules. And I've been around the world and, and people are like, oh, Hindus are all peaceful. No, they're not. Like maybe there's some modern representations here that might look a little different. But if you go to the real culture inside of India and Nepal and, and different Buddhists and things like that, they're not. Well, it's all about love and peace. No. Some of you will remember this, but a few months ago, back, uh, no, it's been a while ago now, but back in November, uh, Pastor Ken and I were in Nepal, and you actually helped pay for a house of a lady who, she became a Christian, she lived near a Hindu temple, when she became a Christian, they got so mad because they thought it would mess with their puja, their worship, she got so mad that she came over, they came over and tore down the wall of her house and painted it and just, just really tried to trash the house and literally knocked down a wall, and you guys were a part of actually fixing the wall in her house. Sounds real peaceful, doesn't it? No, what happens? You get so bound up in rules, you're scared anything is going to mess it up. And so you're bound up and you're all these rules. And now that person became a Christian. Oh, I got to stop that because it's going to ruin it. You with me? That's what religion does. And religion always leaves us feeling condemned, bound up, frustrated. Anybody ever known Sister Sandpaper in the church? Man, my previous church, there's nobody here that way. But my previous church, there used to be this lady. I'm pretty sure she was holy and righteous before God. She probably never sinned, but she was angry and ornery and not friendly, which is probably a sin. And every time you talk to her, her nose scrunched up. She's like, <laughs> never led anybody to Jesus or even toward Jesus. Because ain't nobody want that. Why, why? Because I've known plenty of people who didn't lie or cheat or steal or whatever. And they kept their commandments. And they did everything right. But they weren't doing anything right. Christianity is not about what you're not doing. It's what you are doing. How are you helping the poor? How are you helping those who are less, have less? How are you honoring those around you? How are you loving the unlovable? Christianity is about what you are doing, not just what you're not doing. And as you are doing what God calls you to do, you'll stop doing the other stuff. And that's what we have here. This passage is describing a man who's bound up in religion because he's trying to reach God's impossible standards by his own ability. And he just can't do it. It's like Dion touching the roof. You just can't do it. I don't care if you stack everything up in here. You just can't do it. So the law can do many things. It can guide us. It can teach us. It can tell us about God's character. But it cannot give us the ability to reach God's standard. So religion leaves us bound and feeling condemned. You ever felt like, just, just be honest. I know you can't say this out loud. But just, just between you and me, just the two of us, do you ever feel like I stink at this Christian thing? And you're like, man, I'm really bad at this. It's religion. Jesus never said that to you. It's religion. So religion leads to that. So, so number two, though, the law shows you the standard. Number two, our new nature gives us the, defire, the, the, the desire to defeat sin. So you have two Natures is, is really what you have. Um, I need somebody else to help me out. Brian, it's been a long time since I used you as an example. It's been since Kings Avenue, man. Come on. <laughs> Run up here with your Adidas. Come on. So you have, you are born as a Christian. You are reborn with two natures. You have, you have your, 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 your new nature that is like Christ. Come over here, Brian, will you? You have your new nature that is like Christ, that wants to be like Christ. And then you have your old nature, because Brian's old. <laughs> then you have your old nature, 
which is always trying to pull you away from Christ. It's always trying to let you live for the flesh. You could call it the flesh and the new Christ. This is, this is, this is uh, the second Adam. This is Jesus. You get your nature from him. This is the first Adam. You're born into sin from the original Adam. Uh, and then you're born again into righteousness with the new Adam. Are y'all, y'all with me? Um, and I just want you to see this. There's going to be a struggle inside of you and never think that you're not a good Christian or that you're not a Christian, period, because of the struggle that's inside of you. You know, sometimes people ask me, um, it's a pretty common church question. People say, how do I know I'm saved? Like, cause, you know, you don't always like suddenly feel different, right? Like I, I said this prayer, I followed Christ, I'm trying to commit my life. I don't feel different necessarily. How do I know I'm saved? Let me give you the best thing I can tell you for how to know you're saved. When the struggle that you're having with, with your flesh, when you're having a struggle to follow Christ, you're probably saved. In fact, say it this way. The struggle may be the greatest evidence of your salvation. So this is going to throw you way off for a second. But because you have a new nature, your new nature wants to be like your new father. And as long as you are struggling to be like your new father, because you didn't struggle that way before. I'm not saying you were just a horrible person, but there is a part of you that now wants to be everything God's called you to be. It wants to be holy. It wants to be righteous. You didn't want to be holy and righteous before. Come on. Now this new nature wants that. That struggle is actually a great evidence of your salvation. But it's funny how the enemy will twist that and turn the struggle into being your damnation. Oh, you're a horrible Christian because you struggle. No, you might be a great Christian because you keep struggling. Because the things you struggle with now probably weren't the things you struggled with last year or five years ago or ten years ago. Because the struggle is real, but you are moving on in that struggle. C.S. Lewis one time said, no one knows how how bad he is until he tries to be good. Yeah. You didn't realize how messed up you are until you start following Christ. Oh my goodness. Just look at your neighbor and say, you're jacked up. There's some marriages. Y'all been wanting to say that all week to each other. Pastor just gave you permission. No, but seriously, I just, like, like, this is not churchy for a second. It's not religious, but it's true. Those who struggle, those who follow Jesus closest can sometimes struggle the most. So, oh, no, they can't. The Apostle Paul... The greatest influence on Christianity next to Jesus himself, the one who wrote most of the New Testament, said, I'm struggling. I know you might be closer to Jesus than him, but he was pretty close. The man was beaten all the time, was imprisoned all the time for his faith. The man who was planting churches ever, like like maybe you're holier and more righteous than him, but I'm going to give him credit for a second and think he's really close to Jesus and he still struggles. So maybe it's not about the struggle Maybe it's not about the condemnation inside of the struggle that I'm not good enough. Maybe it's about the fact that I'm struggling and that's actually something to praise God for because the struggle is actually evidence that you're going somewhere. I don't know. This is why you got to be careful judging people because their sin and your sin are two different things. Oh, they can't, they struggle with alcoholism. They can't be saved. What? You struggle with gossip. by the way, we don't do that around here. You know why we don't gossip around here? Not because we're going to stand up and say, stop gossiping, because we're going to honor people. And when you honor people, you stop gossiping. Sins of commission or sins of omission? I'm not going to sit up and say, stop gossiping, stop gossiping, because then you're going to gossip. I am going to stand up and say, love people the way Jesus loves them, honor people the way God honors them, and you'll suddenly stop gossiping. Just saying. But we got to be careful judging people we got to be careful identifying people based on their struggle and making that their identity. Uh, That always, always leads to problems. So then you end up with Joey the drunk and Lizzie the lesbian or whatever, and and, and this becomes their identity. Paul's about to say something in a moment. He's about to say, uh, uh, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Um... Many theologians believe that in that time period, Paul is actually making a metaphor to something that had gone on uh, a, number, a few years before that was still very well known. And that is this, that if, that if a person was a murderer, let me stand up here, just turn your back to, you guys go back to back for a second. If a person was a murderer, so if Dion was a murderer, they would actually, uh, in this particular Roman society, they would actually strap the dead person that he had murdered to his back, back to back. And so... They would take and wrap them together. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Trying to, trying to, come on now. 
they would, they would, they would wrap them together as a, as a way of penalty for the murderer. Obviously, this helps with not having murders. <laughs> and they would strap them this way. And so what would begin to happen would be, let me just tie that around right there. What would begin to happen is that, and this is gross, I'm just being real, but the dead person would begin rotting on top of the flesh of the live person. So the juices and the smells and death would absorb into life and eventually slowly kill the life out of it, out of him. Now that's gross and I ain't trying to be, paint a nasty picture, but it's just real. And so this man would begin affecting this man. One of the problems that we have in modern America and in Christianity is we love to identify with the old man instead of the new man. Uh, go, to, go to that next verse, whatever that is. Um, I think it's, yeah, there we go. Check this out. It says, Paul says something that's really strange that, that honestly, as a counselor or a person who's a counselor, it makes no sense. He says, as it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but sin living in me. So he's talking about the bad things he does. Doesn't that sound a little lame? I didn't do it. Wasn't me. As a counselor, I'd be like, well, who was it? Was some, you know, the one-armed man, right? Was, that was you. He says it twice. He says, for I know the good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do, uh, for I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who did it, but it is sin living in me. All the kids in the room, don't even try that with your parents. not going to work. <laughs> tell you right now. Mom, I can't clean my room because the sin living in me is preventing me from that. <laughs> Just, I mean, come on, think about this. What, Paul? Come on, man. Is this like the devil made me do it? Is this like a, a, well, that's just the way it is. Bless, bless his heart. Bless my heart. That's just, that's just the way God made me. Is that what this is? Because that's what it kind of sounds like. I mean, I'm not the one doing it. <laughs> Don't blame me. Well, yeah, you kind of are the one doing it. Well, what's he saying here? I want you to see this because to me this is so, so powerful. And this is so key to what we're talking about this morning. Paul understands that your identity needs to be wrapped around who you are in Christ and not the old flesh, not the old man. So Paul is making a distinction. Yes, he's physically the one who does these things. And yes, he's physically the one who doesn't amount to what he feels like he should amount to or what have you. Yes, he is that person. But I am going to separate the living new self from the dying and decaying old self. As soon as you start to identify yourself with the old self, you will be that old self. We, we live in this world where everybody wants to identify themselves as something in America today. I identify as, my gosh, there's a million of them, right? As soon as you identify as something other than a Christ follower, now you are living out of the flesh. I'm glad you're a Democrat. I'm glad you're a Republican. Stop, stop identifying yourself that way. You're a Christian. Amen. You're a follower of Jesus. You may be registered one way or the other. I could care less right this second. But, but, but you're, you're a follower of Jesus. That's who you are. You have these other things, but that's who you are. Yeah. Oh, I, I identify as this or that. No, no, no. Uh, well, I'm an alcoholic. No, no, no. The old man is an alcoholic. The sin nature is an alcoholic. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I am a child of God. Oh, oh I, 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 I'm a... I'm a user, I'm a drug user, I've been using drugs. I'm a, no, no, that's the old man in Christ. You have a new nature and I'm going to speak out of the new, new, new nature, not the old nature. I almost said nude nature. That would be weird, right? <laughs> I'm going to speak out of the new nature, not the old nature. This is so big. Because as soon as you start identifying with the old nature, you're never going to live out of the new nature. Right. So whatever your sin is, and we could take a poll around this room, of course nobody would admit to it, but whatever it is, there's a thousand different ones through this church. They're all different. You have a, James says you have your own lust. It's tailor-made just for you. And that's why I can look at it and think, that makes no sense. Me and Ken were talking not long ago, and I was like, I can't understand gambling addictions. People lose everything. They lose their shirt. Gambling makes no sense to me. Why? It's not my sin. That's theirs. I got ones that they probably look at and think makes no sense to them, right? So you got your tailor, and that's why 
you got to be careful judging people. And when you speak of yourself, I'm not an alcoholic. I'm, I'm a sinner saved by grace. I might struggle with alcoholism, but that's the old me. That's the sin nature. That is not me. That is the old flesh. That's the old flesh. And so we got to be careful who we're identifying with because the struggle is real. The struggle is real. And so there's this battle that goes on inside of us. And Paul knew that the struggle about his identity. And so he separates the two. He says, I'm not going to live out of the old person. I'm not going to give credit to any sinful nature. I'm just going to say that's the sinful nature. I am not doing that. And he speaks to who he is. And the struggles of the flesh are real. This is the new Paul and the dead Paul. Hmm. Hmm. Paul's looking and he's fighting this internal battle that all of us face. And if I could quote John the Baptist or, or Jesus about John the Baptist, he said, since the days of John the Baptist, which would include now, the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. If I could camp for just, 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 give, me, just give me two minutes, if I could camp right here for just two minutes. He says something that's, that's odd and, and it takes some thought to process it. He said, the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. The kingdom of God is the lordship of the king. It is the king's domain, the kingdom of God. It is the places that God rules and reigns. And inside of a person, the kingdom of God is going to suffer violence. This side is going to try to attack that side. These juices are going to try to flow into these juices. This dead thing is going to try to come into this dead thing. And Jesus said, the kingdom of God suffers violence, but the violent take it by force. So the struggle that I'm having is truly a war going inside of me. And I will not lose that one, baby. I will defeat this old man. But if we go mammy pamby around it, if we just, come on, any military people in this room, you're never going to defeat sin. You're never going to defeat the old man as long as you just have friends with it. Oh, my goodness. We ain't ready for that yet. So he gets to this place where he's tired and he's bound. And he says, what a wretched man I am. What a wretched man I am. You ever said something similar to that? Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Who will rescue me? Who will rescue me? So he's tired. He's tried it on his own. It's this picture of a man trying to live to God's standards without God's Holy Spirit. And he's tired of trying to be righteous by his own efforts. And he feels like a failure. He probably feels condemned. He probably feels defeated. And he says, who will rescue me? Not the law. I tried that. It just showed me what the issue. It just showed me the standard. That's all it did. Not, not, not the law. Not religion. It just bound me up. Not the doctor. Who's going to rescue me from this body of death? Who's going to untie me from this thing? Who's going to separate me? It's not going to be Buddha. It's not going to be Muhammad. Who's going to rescue me from this thing? Who's going to? It's not going to be a man. It's not going to be a woman. I tried those. Come on, somebody. It's not going to be alcohol. Didn't work. It's not going to be drugs. It didn't work. Who's going to rescue me from this body that is subject to death? It's not education, despite what our government and our nation likes to say. That just makes you a smarter sinner. <laughs> it's not education. It's not money. Oh, if I just had more money, I wouldn't have this issue. Yes, you would. It's not more money. Who is going to rescue me from this? And I love his proclamation that comes out of this. For the first time, he stops looking inward and starts looking outward. Who is going to save me? And he said, thanks be to God. Who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Who is going to deliver you? You can't do it on your own. As long as you're trying to do it on their own, you will fail every time. Because the Holy Spirit gives us the power to not only discern sin, but to actually defeat sin. To actually get that monkey off your back. The Holy Spirit gives you the power to move. See, see, see this is the problem that we have. In the church world, instead of crucifying the flesh, we like to improve the flesh. I don't actually want to kill it. I just want to maintain it. I just want to make it not noticeable to everybody else. I don't want to pull the weeds in my garden. I just want to mow the weeds so you don't see they're there. Because <laughs> that's what religion does. Religion binds you up and he gives it an appearance of holiness. Jesus called them whitewashed tombs. So, so you look like you're living right, but inside ain't right. You know better. So, so, so we're putting lipstick on a pig. We got a dead body running around with us with makeup on. 
<laughs> see, see, Jesus didn't, Jesus doesn't want to improve the flesh. He wants us to crucify the flesh. He wants us to kill it. Look at your neighbor and say, kill it. And so righteousness is a gift is a gift God gives, and it's not based on any works we pursue, we perform. And so we want to do these things, and we strive, but your righteousness is going to be found in Christ. As that point said, Jesus gives us the power to overcome sin. And as long as we, as, as long as we do that, we stand condemned. As long as we focus on the, the flesh, we stand condemned. But as soon as we turn it over to God, we can become righteous in Him and lose that condemnation. See, what the law was powerless to do, God did by sending His own Son. And I love the way that, that Paul phrased it because he said, he said, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ. Your deliverance is to God through the bridge, through the conduit of Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ. You don't need a teacher. The law was a great teacher. You don't need a coach. The law, uh, the, the, your, your new nature is a great coach. It's a motivator. You need a savior. You need somebody who's going to bridge the gap between this platform and that stage, between where you are and perfection, and somebody who's going to take you there. And that's why you go in Christ. We can't take everybody, but if I could, I would take you all in, in the elevator and watch us go to the roof. So as long as you are in Christ, you receive His righteousness and His atonement. So you are in Him, and when God sees you, he actually sees him. And he lifts you up. He takes you to that place. So, so if you're not careful, just reading through Romans 7, it's just kind of depressing. Because it doesn't really go anywhere. And it's like, is this just the defeated lifestyle that, 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 that we live? Is that what this is? is I mean, I mean is, is Paul just defeated all the time? He can never do anything right. Is that who Paul is? Eh, I don't know. Because if you keep reading, it gets, it gets pretty powerful. Because I, I think, I think the hymn writers had it right. If you were to go back mid to early 19th, 20th century, sorry. They, 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 they wrote this hymn that said, I heard an old, old story. Everybody know that? Of how a savior came from glory. <laughs> how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented. Repent means to turn around, means to get rid of. Then I repented of my sin. Anybody know the next line? And won the victory. Huh. Huh. I didn't focus on my sin and won the victory. I didn't talk about my sin. I didn't sit around and tell everybody about my sin. I I repented, changed my mind, moved forward, and then I won the victory. And they would sing, oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me. Anybody know anything about somebody seeking you out? Jesus was chasing you down in the bar and in the club and in the backseat of that car. He sought you out. Somebody talking about, I found Jesus. You didn't find Jesus. He's been chasing you for a long time. You just opened your eyes. He sought me. And he fought me. Oh my goodness. You are made righteous because of the blood of Jesus Christ. You are made righteous because he paid for you with his own blood. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. I loved him before I knew him. And all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. What am I saying? I'm saying I will not be defined by my sin. I will not identify with that's who I am. That sin is under the blood. I will not stand condemned. That sin is beyond me. It's behind me. I'm a new man. If Jesus, if God raised Jesus, he will raise you. The name of our church is Arise. That's not just a name. It's a prophetic declaration. Arise out of that sin. Arise out of that old stuff. Arise out of that garbage. Arise out of that addiction. And be what God called you to be. (laughs) Come down for one second. So the best part of Romans 7 
is that it leads to Romans 8. <laughs> oh, we're almost done. You know, the Bible wasn't written with chapter and verse. Some people think like, you know, when they're writing, they said, oh, this is chapter 8 and this is verse 1. It wasn't written that, but that was, a, you know, 500 years ago or something. We, we, we started writing it that way so that you could find it faster. But the Bible wasn't written that way. The Bible was written as one long dialogue. And so from chapter 7 to chapter 8, there is no gap. It's just we created a gap to help you find it faster. So as you go from chapter 7 to chapter 8, you find something that's very powerful to me. Very famous verse, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, by the way, anytime you see the word therefore, you need to know what it was put there for. The very word says, go back and read chapter 7 when you start chapter 8. Because if you read chapter 8 without chapter 7, you're going to be all lost. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. There is therefore now how much condemnation? Wait a minute. So I've been condemning myself for not being everything I think I'm supposed to be. I've been condemning myself because I'm supposed to pray more and I'm supposed to read my, but, 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 but. If Jesus is not condemning me, who's actually condemning me? I got seepage from the old dead man seeping into my mind saying, you're not good enough. Who told you you're not good enough? Who told you that? The very fact that you're struggling shows that you're walking after Christ. I don't, I don't dismiss my children because they fall when they're learning to walk. Ty's learning to drive right now. I don't dismiss him because he makes a mistake on the road. I say, let's not do that again. Come on. And then we laugh about it. We move on. I don't get mad. I don't, I don't condemn him. Neither does your heavenly father condemn you. You're not condemned. You're not condemned at all. You condemn yourself. It's the old man. See, but, but watch this. He says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those. I love it because he didn't say there's a little bit. He, he didn't say, he, he didn't say like, you know, there's, you know, a little bit of condemnation. He says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. By the way, you know why? Let's keep reading. We'll say why. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For the law, for what the law was powerless to do, I could point the standard, but it couldn't get you there. Because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful in his likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. If you read the New Testament, if you read the, 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 the New Covenant, you see repeatedly this phrase, in Christ. In Christ. It's really, it's, it's really another way of saying in the New Covenant, in the new way of thinking, in grace, uh, in the new way in Christ if you are in Christ he became that offering for you so if you are in the elevator you in Christ you cannot suffer from condemnation why because God can't condemn Jesus he cannot he will not he has not ever condemned Jesus because Jesus is the only one who actually lived up to the standard. So Jesus is not condemned. Therefore, if you are in Christ, you can't be condemned. Because when God looks at you, he sees his son. When God looks at you, <laughs> he sees perfection despite your flaws. He sees everything you can be because he's looking through the image of the blood of Jesus Christ. I love this. So he came to set you free. You guys are tired of standing there by now. He came for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so, wait a minute. Wait, he doesn't condemn you. What does that say? And so he condemned. Wait a minute. I thought, I thought God was condemning me for not being good enough. That's not what it says. It says there's no condemnation for you, but there is condemnation for what? So God wants to give you victory 
by yeah. ripping off the sin off of your life and putting it on the cross and crucifying it because the sin of your life is condemned. In order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit. I don't live according to the flesh but according to the spirit. Oh, come on, stand up with me around this room. Get this. If you feel condemned, if you feel condemned, you are living according to what is condemned. You're living according to the flesh. But in Christ, there is therefore no condemnation. You have been set free. time I feel that spirit coming up in me and said oh you messed up you're not good enough you're not praying enough I said shut up devil I'm gonna pray right now just because you said that I'm gonna read my Bible no there's no condemnation that condemnation is not coming from God it's coming from the flesh in Christ Ooh, there is no condemnation oh come on church this is what I want you to see. Stop identifying with the flesh. The flesh is condemned. Live in the spirit, not in the flesh. Crucify the flesh. Stop living in it. Stop acting like this is your world. This ain't your world no more. It might have used to been, but it's not anymore. Crucify the flesh. Live out of the spirit. And in that place, there is no condemnation. Because even the fact that you don't reach what you want to reach, even the fact that you aren't as holy as you want to live, even the fact that you're not everything that you feel like you should be, just in that very thought alone shows that your new nature is working and that you desperately want to be. Can our prayer team go ahead and make their way up front? Now here's where it's got to get real serious for a second. Because the Bible says, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But I'd be doing a bad job as a pastor if I didn't say the flip side of that is true too. If you are not in Christ Jesus, there will be condemnation. When you are not right with God, when you are not in his presence, when you are not living out of the spirit and not the flesh, when you're not right with God, you will stand before God one day and you will be condemned. Not because God didn't give you every opportunity to give your life to him and live out of him, but because you chose to say no repeatedly throughout life. I don't want a single person in this room to be condemned. I want you to stand before God in righteousness and holiness because you are in Christ. But if you're not in Christ, I wish it were easier, but it's not. So we're going to pray in just a second, and Pastor Jason's going to lead us in a song as we wrap everything up, sing one last song, and Pastor Joshua will come and close us out. But some of you in this room, you don't know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. And if you stood before God today, you would be condemned. You might have tried to do it in your own strength, in your own religion. You might be on your own journey or whatever. But the only way to reach that standard is in Christ. Otherwise, you are. You do stand condemned. Would you bow your heads with me? Close your eyes for just a second. Around this room, for some of you, today's your day. The Holy Spirit's knocking on the door of your heart. Today is your day to surrender your life to Christ and become in Christ. If that's you, I'm not going to belabor this moment. I want to pray over you. Around this room, if that's you, just stick your hand up so I can pray with you. Come on. Amen. 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 See you even up in the balcony. Amen. Come on. Everybody just pray with me. Say, Jesus, I need you. I want to be everything you've called me to be. So I surrender my life completely to you. From this day forward, I will follow you. Make me new. Make me holy. Fill me with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on. Yeah.
And Pastor Jason's going to lead us in one last song. If you want special prayer for just a moment, come on up. We want to agree with you. If you'd like to receive communion, it's on my right and left under the screens. We'd love to agree with you there as well. But I want us to be celebrating as we go out. Even if I struggle, there is no condemnation in my struggle. My struggle shows that I'm trying and reaching and pushing. And I want to be everything that God's called me to be. I want to be be righteous and that's what this evidence that's what the struggle is evidence of come on amen father we thank you for this word i pray that it seals in our hearts god draw people up to the altars at your uh, your discretion in jesus name we pray amen